Mr. Beast and the new Prime Video deal, and Shannon Sharp and how much money he made on that Cat Williams episode. Joe Rogan and Spotify, LeBron James now has a podcast with the great JJ Reddick. What's happening with the WWE? What is up, everybody, and welcome on inside yet another edition of the Business of Social Podcast, powered by STN Digital. I'm your host, David Brickley. Each and every show, we dive into the ever-changing social digital marketing landscape. This show is no different. We're bringing you uh, what we like to call a mini pod in this edition of the Business of Social because there's so many stories that producer Kayla and I have really been uh, bookmarking over the last couple of weeks, especially the rise of personal media brands. There's a revolution happening in media right now. And we know, you know, from linear to streaming, we know that we went from every single entity has their own streamer. And now we're starting to see the consolidation of that with the joint venture in sports that is happening between what ESPN, Fox and Warner Media. Um, and there's just so much change, you know, MLS deal with Apple Plus. But we had a few stories here, Kayla, that we have bookmarked that we wanted to dive deeper into. And I'll let the listeners know that we want to dive a little bit into Mr. Beast and the new Prime Video deal. We have some thoughts on Shannon Sharp and how much money he made on that Cat Williams episode and how he continues to really rise up the podcast charts. Joe Rogan and Spotify. LeBron James now has a podcast with the great J.J. Redick. Uh, Jason and Travis Kelsey just continue to crush the game. And not so much personal media empires, but what's happening with uh, the WWE and the changeover from Vince McMahon to really Triple H and that new holding company, TKO, with The Rock on the board and how he's came back to wrestling and they broke records. So, so much to get into, Kayla. I don't even know where to start. You can... Make sure I stay on pace. I don't forget any of these stories. But those are, I remember, all the stories we bookmarked. And I think the listeners will really enjoy and get some value out of us breaking these a little bit down, more down. And also, just what the significance or impact that we're seeing across the media landscape and marketing and, and social digital, etc. So, Kayla, as always, steer the, steer the ship for me so we can stay on track. <laughs> of course. So... We got to kick it off talking about Mr. Beast. Of course, we know he's yeah. top YouTuber on the platform, more than 245 million subscribers. But let's dive into this deal that he just inked with Amazon. Yeah, so this is very interesting. So he, with, you know, the news came out a few weeks ago that there will be a reality competition show called Beast Games. And anybody that follows Mr. Beast, Pretty much every one of his videos is some type of challenge where he locks somebody in a grocery store for 30 days for a million dollars or whatever it may be. And every day you stay in, you get an extra 10 grand and they bring out the dollars on a, I feel like on a uh, a pallet with a, a forklift and it's all in dollar bills, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, this is the first time that really we're seeing someone that has just dominated the YouTube space, dominated the digital space getting a large deal with one of the streamers, um, the winner of this reality competition will get $5 million. And if you think about it, you know, Mr. Beast, the estimated earnings uh, between June of 2022 and June of 2023, $82 million in gross earnings, more than twice that of any digital creator. So for him to sign a deal with Amazon and to be the face of this new game show, um, I don't think we have the actual deal. I don't think they've made that public, but... If he's making $82 million on just his YouTube stuff, uh, and we know he has the merch and he has the the uh, food products and all the stuff, the ecosystem that is, uh, you know, Mr. Beast, this is probably a very lucrative deal. Um, again, factoring that he makes $82 million just on the YouTube. However, I've, I have seen interviews where he's like, hey, most of the money I just put right back into the channel, whether it's uh, special effects or blowing stuff up or using some of that money as some of those grand prizes that he gets in order to get more viewers. But very, very uh, interesting to see Amazon really parlaying the fan base that is Mr. Beast. And also, I know he did a test on Twitter and X, uh, you know, because they have some AdSense programming or some sharing there. Um, and I don't know if Elon um, was able to help boost that, but that was very successful when he when he posted a video on X. So I think there's a lot of different streams of income that he can make in particular, but good for Prime Video for you know trying to parlay the success of a digital creator because all his fans can then go right. follow him to Prime Video. So that's I think that's a significant deal in our in our landscape here. No, agreed. It'll be interesting to see. 
um, how this plays out in the long run. But let's shift gears into a topic that we we know and love all too well. Let's talk Shannon Sharp. Say, say. Love Shay Sharp podcast. Let's get into it. I mean, this Cat Williams interview was pretty darn successful. Yeah, we did a social post recently on my social channels, the Top 10 Sports Podcast. And I believe, obviously, Club Shay Shay was, I believe, around number three, but also... Um, Nightcap with Chad El Sochinko and also Gilbert Arenas uh, is on there a lot as well, was inside the top 10 too. So Shannon Sharp has gone, it's pretty motivational too. He's gone from Fox Sports and Undisputed um, and they essentially let him go. It wasn't working out with Skip Bayless and he's like, we got to move on. He leaves Fox Sports and Undisputed. He does a couple days a week on ESPN with Stephen A. Smith and First Take. But because of that moment, he's like, I'm going to take destiny in my own hands. I'm going to launch my own media empire. And the amount of success he's had so early on with not one but two top 10 sports podcasts in the you know in the world in in what 6 months i mean he launched these platforms i mean less than a year ago but we've we've been you know Kayla and i have both been obsessed with this cat williams episode because we feel like it's the one of the most viral moments and we've ever seen in the history of social media and we see all these receipts that are coming out and it was just mind blowing um, to to witness what happened after that episode. But we've already broke that down on the show before. What I really want to get into is the news that Shannon Sharp said that the infamous Cat Williams interview made him more money, just that one single interview, than any single NFL season that he did while he was in the NFL. So uh, he made $22.3 million in his career. Um, he said, whatever you think it is, double it. If you think it's 500 grand, I made a million. If you think it's 3 million, I made 6 million. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, based on what he said and based on his career earnings, probably in that three to $5 million range on one single freaking episode. And he got all those subscribers and able to, able to parlay that success with future interviews. Um, the most he ever made in this season when he was in the NFL was $5 million in 2000. So if he's saying it's more money than he ever made in the NFL, my original prediction is wrong. It's at least $5 million, which is so incredible. And you look at what Mr. Beast has built in his empire. And now you look at Shannon Sharp and the sports landscape. And listen, talking to my friends over at Turner and Bleacher Report, they're going all in, as you can see, with the Micah Parsons podcast, Trey Young, um, you know Taylor Rooks. But they're really working with athlete-centric podcasts. And a lot of them don't even have the Ernie Johnson. They don't have you know, the traffic cop that can, you know, make sure that the player says what they want. That's why I think we're seeing this shift, right, is Shannon Sharp is going solo. But when you're talking about nightcap, it's Shannon Ocho Cinco. No longer do you have the traditional journalist that is the studio head, that is Ernie Johnson that's throwing the Charles, throwing the shack. It's just like put the athletes on the platform and go to work. And that's something we've never seen in media. And it seems to be working so well that every athlete has a podcast, and there's some pretty bad ones out there. But this is a definitely change. And Kayla, I know you've you've really surveyed the podcast landscape. You've been a podcaster, so I know you know this game well. This is very new where let's just let the players host it all and keep the show moving, and we don't need the intermediary. No, agreed. I, I think it's been pretty amazing to see like just how – big of an empire you can build like with your own resources and not the backing of like these big networks and such. I also saw a very interesting take and this was I think from Ryan Rosillo on the ringer and I thought it was brilliant. For so long athletes have been very irritated at the talking heads giving these hot takes because they say you don't know the game of basketball, you've never played at this level, you don't have context. I think um, it was Udonis Haslam on his podcast said that Chris Bosh was the most important player on the, on those Miami Heat teams above LeBron James and Dwayne Wade. And Ryan Rosillo was like, that's an absurd take. Like, that's an absolute wrong, absurd take. And what he said was like, it's great that all these players have podcasts now, but now it's kind of going full circle where, yes, there was these talking heads on ESPN or what have you that used to say absurd things, but they always said, you don't know the game. You don't have the context. But even the guys that know the game and know the context, they're also making some really difficult, terrible hot takes as well. So it goes to show any human, uh, regardless of if they played or don't, is capable of making bad takes and capable of making absurd takes as well. Saying Chris Boss is more important than LeBron and Dwayne Wade is a pretty silly take. So that's what we're trying to see is it's not so easy 
when you have to fill airtime, you're probably going to slip up and say some silly things once in a while. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. But I mean, of course, it, it's it's always nice to see, you know, we cannot talk about podcasts without talking about Joe Rogan. He's inked a new multi-year deal with Spotify. Yeah. So we what what do we that. call him? The podcast czar or the king podcaster? I mean, obviously, he's number one uh, when it comes to, I mean, and he started it, what, back in the early 2000s before podcasting was even a thing. But he's definitely the biggest podcaster out there. New contract oh, yeah. with Spotify worth as much as $250 million over its multi-year term. These are big, big numbers uh, for one single person that is hosting a weekly regular show. What's different about this renewal, Kayla, that you and I were talking about is before, and it made sense. Spotify said, we're going to give you all this money, but you got to be exclusive to Spotify. That way, we can get all your listeners over to our platform and you can't upload your full episodes to YouTube. You can't upload your full episodes to other platforms. And because of that, they were able to recruit a lot of Joe Rogan's audience to purchase Spotify. That way they can get their Joe Rogan fix, if you will, on the Spotify platform. What's really interesting about this new deal, it is no longer exclusive. Joe Rogan can post a podcast wherever he wish. It's still gonna live on Spotify and they're gonna be ad partners. So therefore, they feel like they can get more views collectively and make more money as a team collectively if it lives on YouTube and Spotify and Apple Podcasts and, 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 and. What's really interesting, I was actually listening to the Andrew Scholl's Flagrant 2 podcast, and he made a really brilliant point. What Spotify was trying to do with that original deal, and let's think about this as marketers, they were trying to do something that's very, very difficult to do, change consumer behavior. As podcast fans, a lot of us go straight to Apple Podcasts. A lot of us were conditioned to go to YouTube. What Spotify did, the reason they spent the original $250 million to make Joe Rogan exclusive is, hey, oh, by the way, we have podcasts on Spotify. I know you already listen to the music in your car and in the gym. You also should really check out our podcast section because we have a lot of amazing podcasts. And the majority of people like the business of social, we upload our podcast to YouTube. Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. I think consumers overall would forget just the education part of it that, oh, I can also get my fix on Spotify and keep it all under one app. What's brilliant about what they did and what Andrew Scholes broke down more eloquently than I could, and I would recommend checking out this episode on YouTube or this clip, is they now have changed consumer behavior. A lot of people, including myself, that used to go to Apple Podcasts and search in the bar, entrepreneur podcast, business podcast, whatever, I'm now doing that in Spotify, or at least doing it much more than I did before. And they feel like they've checked the consumer behavior box where they've been able to really shift the market. And no different. We always make the joke, right? It's like, whatever happened to Postmates? Like, they used to have, you know, the game on lock. And I'm sure listeners are like, why is David so obsessed with this Postmates thing? But they used to, just like with uh, Skype, right? Skype, they always say during COVID, you know, they had a 20-year head start and still found a way to fumble the bag. Here comes Zoom. And I think, you know, when you change consumer behavior and somebody has such a market share on something like podcasting and Spotify wants to reverse that or change where you go to when you're searching in that search bar, much like TikTok has done. I find myself searching on TikTok much more than I do on Google because I want the 60 second recap of what's going on with the Diddy story or whatever may be happening in the, in the news rather than searching a bunch of articles and, and, and maybe not getting the summary I'm looking for. So that's big. That's really big that, again, not only are these individuals like Mr. Beast and Joe Rogan and Shannon Sharp um, making a ton of money and getting these incredible like LeBron James type contracts or, or Messi type contracts with their media, <clears throat> but I thought it was really interesting the way Andrew Scholes broke that down is Spotify paid a lot of money to change consumer behavior. And the reason why it's not exclusive in this second deal is they feel like they did change the consumer behavior. Oh, no, they absolutely did. So, I mean, it, the Joe Rogan reign isn't letting up anytime soon. So more to come from him, I'm sure. But you mentioned LeBron James. Mm -hmm. He's joining the podcast space with JJ Reddick. Now that's going to shake some stuff up, I'm sure. What I thought was interesting about this, and I don't think Kobe gets enough credit, but um, he actually came out with a show on ESPN Plus called Detail. And what he would do is he would break down different players' games, like James Harden, Jason Tatum, and he would he would essentially be like in the film room and say, hey, here's how Jason Tatum 
breaks through the double team. And here's how he's using his body to create separation to get a clean look at a fadeaway. And it was very, first of all, you want to hear Kobe break down the game. That's just awesome. <clears throat> but second of all, it was a different look in teaching younger kids the game. And that's exactly what LeBron James said after one of the recent Laker games. Like the reason he finally wanted to get into the podcast space and partner with JJ is he wants to teach the youth the game of basketball. And what he said, which I agree with, he said, the talking head stuff is great. And who's better, me or Michael Jordan or what have you? But he felt like the marketplace, that's all there was. There was nobody talking about the nuances of basketball, nobody talking about how to win championships and how to have teamwork and those different things. And listening to LeBron and JJ, I think the the first episode got 1.3 million YouTube video uh, views in one single day. Uh, and I think within 24 hours, they had almost 400,000 subscribers. So talk about someone as big as LeBron James. He launches it. He creates a brand new platform for him. This is not on the uninterrupted YouTube channel. They have their own brand called Mind the Game with LeBron and JJ. But they're usually drinking a glass of wine. <laughs> and they're usually getting really deep in uh, the nuances of basketball and offenses and sets and how to uh, defend different sets and what happened back in... Um, you know, 2013 with the Dallas Mavericks in game seven and da, da 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 So it's a really interesting podcast. I think what's great is when you can start a niche that nobody really is doing because you have, again, the Shannon Sharp and Ocho Cinco talking about the sports stories. You have the first take stuff. You have PFT and Barstool, you know, you know, bringing that, you know, humor to the sports landscape. But People make arguments all the time that LeBron James may have the highest basketball IQ in the history of the NBA. So wouldn't it be cool to kind of see how his mind works now? Will this work for a thousand episodes? It's yet to be seen. How much can you break down his career? How much can you break down current games? We'll see how this podcast evolves. But, you know, checking out the first four episodes or so, I think him and JJ play off each other really well. I think they both geek out over the game of basketball and teaching the game to the up and comers. So you know, kudos to to both of them. But talk about the Joe Rogan deal as they continue to get uh, subscribers and um, continue to get views on this podcast, both on YouTube and on on platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can imagine what they can demand potentially from an exclusive with a different platform. So uh, definitely interesting to see LeBron and JJ zigging when everybody else is zagging. Oh no, for sure. This is definitely one to watch. Another one that is one to watch and that a lot of people have been watching is Jason and Travis Kelsey's yes. New Heights podcast. Another potential huge deal on the horizon. For yeah, them. and on, on my social media when we broke down, Kayla, um, and you did the research for me, so I want to give you kudos. But yeah, the top 10 sports podcasts uh, out there right now, according to Spotify. Uh, of course, as we, as we all know, working in sports and entertainment, Jason, Travis, number one, and really being able to uh, upset, if you will, PFT and the Barstool guys, who I think have really owned that number one spot for what seems like five, six, seven years. Um, but again, a, a, if you don't know, Jason Kelsey, uh, who was the, he just retired recently, right? But was the center with the uh, Philadelphia Eagles and Travis Kelsey, the tight end uh, for, who doesn't know? Do I have to explain that Travis Kelsey is now with the whole Taylor Swift stuff? Uh, but it launched back in September 2022. It is number one in sports podcasts. But what's very interesting is, um, you know, Eric Silver, who's the head of development at Multitude, a podcast collective, said he wouldn't be surprised if they got a $100 million deal. So again, we're talking about Joe Rogan and $250 million. It's all about listeners and, and how much ad revenue you can uh, create in the marketplace. But I think, you know, we saw the Caller Daddy stuff and, and, and those $25 million deals with Spotify. These guys look like they're getting more listeners than that. So there is a marketplace for that. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see what they, what they demand and if they go exclusive or if, like Joe Rogan now is, are they everywhere, but they partner with a media company to uh, sell advertisement and kind of split the revenue on that, which I think a lot of times these guys are good enough to have a platform and to have really entertaining shows, but do they have the back end business sense to not business sense? Do they have the back end ad sales team to get the big sponsors? That's usually why these podcasters and media entities will partner with um, really a back end sales team that can make sure they're monetizing their asset and monetizing all the listeners that they're getting. So that's something that Kayla and I are keeping an eye on. We were talking about 
uh, shoot last week, like, man, they're number one. Everybody knows about them. The, the, you know, the Taylor Swift bump definitely helped this podcast. And I think even the Swifties listen to it to make sure they get little insights on what Taylor Swift is up to with Travis. But yeah, I mean, this is the time now to capitalize while they're scorching hot, especially the fact that Jason recently retired. I think you can make an argument that it's at its peak right now with the Taylor Swift craze, the Kelsey retiring, Travis Kelsey just coming off a Super Bowl, and he's kind of on the tail end of his career. No better time now than to capitalize. Oh, no, absolutely. So, I mean, like a lot of the others, we'll definitely keep monitoring this story to see what comes through. Yeah, and to tie so, a bow on this before we get into WrestleMania, again, we just wanted to make a point. Mr. Beast, Joe Rogan, LeBron James, uh, Shannon Sharp, Jason, Travis Kelsey. We wanted to make an episode about this because we are seeing the media landscape shift more to athlete-centric podcasts. Not only is it shifting, it's very, very monetarily pleasing to these athletes uh, when Shannon Sharp can make $5 million plus on one single freaking episode. And maybe Travis and uh, Jason could command $100 million from a media entity to partner up with them. So um, again, who knows what Mr. Beast got because he's probably the number one followed creator on the planet. So we know that that's big money. So what I wanted to make sure the listeners understood about this and one thing that I've seen is it's all about attention. And at one point it was radio. Then it was all about TV. Then it was all about cable television. Then it went into streaming. And now we're starting to see that this is a different avenue that could command the same type of viewership. So again, going back to the day with Friends or Seinfeld or whatever it may be, the reason they were so successful, the reason they made so much money is they were able to demand a very high 30-second commercial rate because there were so many eyeballs on a 30-minute episode of Friends. No different than what is the advertising rate on one single episode of Jason and Travis if, I don't know what the numbers are, if they're getting 3 million views or what have you every single episode, and we saw that with LeBron James. I mean, the first episode got 1.3 million views on YouTube alone. Who knows when you add the downloads? Who knows when you add the clips that they did after the show? So all to say that if Shannon Sharp can now make $5 million off of advertising revenue because of how many views these things get, it's just something that we all need to be paying attention to as marketers because it's a different it's something different that we've seen over the last 10 years or so. And it's important for us all to see if we can leverage it with our respective brands. No, absolutely. It's, Listen to the consumer. The consumer is saying they like it. So how do you, how do you uh, double down on it? Consumers are always right. Is that, is that the saying? Speaking of consumers always right. I'm going to pause there because I think what an amazing transition. I want to, this is kind of like left field because it's not about personal, uh, athlete, you know, media deals. But I, I tweeted this uh, this last weekend, Kayla, and I know you saw it, and I talked about it with you and Alex on our weekly call. Um, I watched wrestling as a kid, as most boys do, I think, right? From 13 to 15 years old, I was hooked. The Rock, Stone Cold, Undertaker, Triple H, that, the Attitude Era uh, back then when I was um, a teenager, uh, it was must-see TV for me. It's been about 20 years since I've watched a wrestling match, um, at least with the WWE. We, we were partners with AEW back in the day, so that was a little bit different. But for the first time in 20 years, I said two things. Two things changed with my personal consumer behavior, which I think a lot of people in my seat would agree with. I watched more women's basketball games during March Madness than I did men's games, and I flipped on WrestleMania for the first time in 20 years. Why did those two things happen? Number one, on the women's side, I, I made this point as well. It's, you know, we kind of lose the story or the investment of players on the men's game because of the one and dones, right? They play one year, they're out. A lot of the NBA now is international, so you don't really get to see them play like a Luka, like a, uh, like a Joker. They're amazing. They're incredible, and they're, and they're making the NBA great. But you don't, get, you don't get invested as a United States sports watcher in those guys but we get invested in Angel Reese. We get invested in Caitlin Clark. We're getting invested in Juju Watkins. And when they're playing three years at the college level, you can follow them and you can know their name and it can be must-see TV where even the big programs like Kentucky or Duke, I mean, they're just running through players so much you can't even really find a favorite player that you want to follow like back in the day. So 
the fact that I watch more women's game than men's game, I think is um, not just me. I mean, they they got more viewers, 18.7 million viewers versus I believe 14 million viewers for the men's. First time the women's title game has outpaced the men's title game in the history of college basketball. That's a big deal. So we know women's sports is doing great. We know women's basketball seems to be more must-see TV than the men's side, at least on the college level. And we'll see what happens when Caitlin goes to uh, the Indiana Fever and how that affects WNBA ratings. By the way, already Indiana Fever games in the different markets like New York Liberty or LA Sparks or whatever, you it's like five times the ticket price than the other games. So you could tell already there's going to be some Caitlin mania happening. Um, so that's one thing. But I did want to point on the WrestleMania part. Why did David Brickley, after 20 years, <laughs> flip on the main event of WrestleMania, not on Saturday and on Sunday? Because it was a two-parter. And the reason that was, I can say for me, is the TikTok algorithm. I liked a, a, a Rock post. I watched the full video of The Rock, and he's coming back. And I just got sucked in for six weeks on this storyline. And for those of you that don't know, I won't bore you with all the details. But essentially, The Rock came back to WWE, and he took the place of somebody, Cody Rhodes, who deserved the title shot against Roman Reigns. And the WWE crowd, the consumer, that's why I made that transition, the consumer hated that. I mean, The Rock, as I'm sure you saw this too, Kayla, The Rock on social media got killed uh, when he announced that he would be in the main event. All the comments said, you're you're terrible, and why'd you come back, and poor Cody Rhodes, and why'd you take his place, and who the hell are you, and you can't just do movies and come back whenever you want. It was bad. I mean, the consumer said, this is BS. And kudos to the WWE and The Rock, because they said, okay, Let's listen to the consumer. The Rock became the bad guy. He embraced the villain. They allowed Cody Rhodes to keep his title shot. And it was just this six-week lead-up where The Rock was able to play the villain and the bad guy. And it was must-see TV, if you will. And it really was an incredible storyline. And again, with Vince McMahon exiting the WWE for all those unfortunate reasons, and Triple H now being the chief content officer they listened to the fans, and then at WrestleMania, uh, John Cena came back. The Undertaker came back. It was just incredible cinema, and it was the number one WrestleMania of all time. They sold, I think, 145,000 tickets over the two days. Uh, it was the most socially viewed WrestleMania of all time. Um, oh, sold more than yeah, 90,000 tickets. Um, standing room only. 145,000 fans over two days. At they they filled the freaking Eagles Lincoln Financial Outdoor Stadium. Um, but so interesting, right? Where again, I think when you see the Manning cast and you see different different views of sports and I just feel like there's this new sense of we're listening to the consumer more. Um, something as big as an entity as TKO and WWE, they're able to change storylines in real time to make sure the consumer is happy. I'm just noticing a shift, and what a brilliant shift by the WWE, but a shift in the media landscape in general where it's like, oh, you guys really love player-focused podcasts? Let's lean into that. Oh, you guys aren't using a Spotify for uh, you know, your search bar. Let's lean into that. Um, it's just very interesting how fast this stuff is moving, but kudos to the WWE because they got me. I know they got a lot of other people like me, and I will say the power of TikTok once you kind of get sucked into that algorithm, like, oh, David liked a couple of these WWE videos. We're going to keep on feeding him this storyline. I'm like, all right, I'm hooked. I got to watch this thing now. And I think all of us can relate to that in some way where once you get down that TikTok algorithm and, and it's it's pushing you more storyline. I'm also, unfortunately, Kayla, we've talked about this. I'm I'm deep in like the the Diddy allegations, you know, algorithm where I almost don't want to. It's like a bummer to see it, but... I've watched enough of it. I think TikTok is feeding me more updates that I don't even want to hear about. So yeah, I, I think TikTok in particular with how good the algorithm is, is uh, able to push you things that in a good way for the WWE allowed me a 20 plus year uh, sideline wrestling fan to get back in the game. No, I agree. And I mean, I was, we were a WWE family growing up, like going <laughs> to the live shows and such. So oh, wow. I mean, for me, it was X, so I like was spiraling on X, and then I'm like, man, I, my mom still has like a bunch of WWE tapes in her entertainment set. So now I'm like, dang, 
I want to go watch. Oh, and good for The Rock, too. I mean, he is, I mean, his reputation is really clean. Um, and he's he does Disney movies and Moana, Moana and all that stuff, right? Um, I think he was the the tooth fairy at one point. But I mean, his his um his brand with all his sponsors and all his movie deals is very clean. And he turned, I mean, good for him. He turned to the, be the villain. He was cussing. He was making jokes about Cody Rhodes' mom and everything. Like he went true heel, as they call in the in the wrestling business, uh, because that's what the the company needed. That's what the consumer wanted. Um, and even though uh, it was risky for him as such a a, a clean actor and things like that, um, I think it actually paid off for him in more ways than one. So it was definitely a risky endeavor. But the WWE one, I think the Rock one, I think more respect for him as a personality, as a wrestler, but also as just um, a media entity that he is and how big he is. So I was just so impressed with that. But again, I was thinking about that. I'm like, it's amazing that two major shifts in my behavior happen, the women's tournament versus the men's tournament, and a 20-year break to me diving back into WrestleMania. I think those are significant, and I think there's a lot of stories like mine um, that I think it's it's important to keep an eye on. So there you have it. Uh, a lot of stories, of course, on the player-centric and the personal media brands that we're seeing and the profit that's being garnered by these individuals. And then a quick aside about Caitlin Clark, the women's tournament and WrestleMania, but I thought it was all relevant and all stuff that we've been talking about around the water cooler here at the STN offices. So anything I missed, Kayla? I mean, any other thoughts to put a bow on this bad boy? No, I, I think it, um, we're in a new era. Like we said, consumers are right. So mm. it's so much will be, is to be seen in terms of yeah. how these brands are moving forward. And I'll leave you with this. The consumer always wins. So even when, as a sports fan, it was easier for me 10 years ago to have direct TV and all my favorite sports were in one place. Then we had the bifurcation of sports where what is the playoff game on Peacock or is it on Amazon Prime? I mean, is it on TV? Like, where, how do I find the freaking Chiefs game? And that's confusing and it makes the consumer experience more difficult. And if I can't find you, I get frustrated. You can do that for a while, but ultimately, the consumer always wins, and that's why you're seeing the joint venture by ESPN, Fox, and Warner Media. I think we'll see more consolidation, and we'll just go full circle. Like, oh, it is nice to have all, all one, the one stop shop like we used to have. So, although I, I get it that people saw Netflix and everybody wanted to have their own Netflix, we're just, we're noticing that that's not a really profitable scenario, and you're even seeing companies like ESPN. They care about the round number now. They used to only care about not only. They used to be very fixated on exclusivity with the ESPN Plus subscribers. Now they're like, okay, when we add up our TV people that still have cable and ESPN Plus and the joint venture and us licensing content to A, a B, and C, what's the round number that we can show our investors and show Wall Street? And I think that's a better way to look at it. I think ultimately the consumers win in that uh, in that that uh, new era, if you will, like you just mentioned, Kayla. So there you have it, another mini pod. I hope that was. Uh, helpful. And our goal is to, if you were living under a rock and you didn't hear some of these stories, like just listen to the business social. We got you. We'll make sure we keep you up on and keep our thumb on the pulse of all these things. So you stay in the know on all things sports entertainment uh, on the business of social podcast. So of course, thanks to producer Kayla. Thanks to, uh, what do you call it? Technical producer KDO. Thanks to Grace Brady, all the people that are helping out on the program. This has been yet another edition of the Business of Social podcast. My name is David Brickley, and it's all been powered by STN Digital.